Namaste. So let's pick up from where we left off the last time with verse 13. The consciousness, Chaitanya, associated with the aspect Am, is called Shakti. The universe shines by its light. The entire creation is Shakti's Sankalpa, thought. The state of mind which is completely devoid of all attachment is the pure wisdom to be attained. So there are two aspects we're going to talk about today. I and am. The Shakti Tattva is the am, the existence. And the Shiva Tattva is the I, the essence. So let me read the next verse and then we'll discuss. The void which is the infinite and all-encompassing all one whole without a second, which is just the effulgence of pure wisdom, which is completely devoid of visible phenomena, and which consists of the aspect I, is the seed which fructifies as liberation, bestowing salvation by enabling one to unite with the Supreme. So, there's something and there's nothing. There's the creation and there's the emptiness which enfolds it. The void is not nothing, but rather, he says, it shines with the effulgence of pure wisdom. So, this effulgence, this light, is reflected by Shakti. And this is what happens in deep meditation when the thought of I and mine are completely absent. One sees light. But this light is not glowing by itself. It is the reflection of the pure awareness, the pure being of Shiva. Shivam is the light, Shakti is the reflection. Shivam is the energetic, Shakti is the energy. Shivam is the source, Shakti is the emanation. So try to understand. These two aspects of reality, the original duality, are consciousness on the one hand because it has an object. Uh, Shakti is consciousness. But Shivam is something more fundamental. The being, the existence prior to consciousness, which we can call pure awareness or objectless awareness. It has no object. Well, why? Uh, isn't Shivam aware of Shakti? Yes, but not as a phenomenon. Not as a phenomenon, but as an appearance only. We use the example many times of a movie theater. Huh? You go in the theater, the lights dim, picture comes on the screen. The projector is like Shivam. The screen is like Shakti. Shakti is simply reflecting the light of Shivam. So the pictures on the screen are not real. They're simply flat, two-dimensional. They approximate the appearance of something real. Because <laughs> even so-called real things aren't real. <laughs> but it's a dream. Shakti is Shiva's dream. But that's okay, he can dream. Well, but when he dreams, he creates universes. <laughs> Why? Because he is the substrate of the reality, the actual reality, that which never changes. See, if 
the creation was real, it would mean that Shiva changes, that he's no longer supreme, that he becomes part of the duality. But that can never happen. That's impossible. So Shakti creates only the appearance of duality. There is no real duality. Try to understand. That's why there is no real path. Huh? Like the Zen people say, there's no Buddha, no Dharma, no Sangha, <laughs> no path. Enlightenment simply is. And most people, it's covered over. Covered with what? Desire, delusion, suffering, the apparency of existence and motion and so on, doing, cause and effect and so on. So that means that real awareness, huh? Shivam. See, uh, Shiva uses the word Chaitanya in the first verse, associated with Shakti. Chaitanya means consciousness, awareness with an object. But he doesn't use it in the second verse. He talks, he tells about the void, infinite and the all-encompassing one whole without a second. So this void isn't actually a nothingness, it's an emptiness in which there is no possibility of becoming. Because to become, there would have to be a second thing. Huh? But it's one without a second. That means there can't be any becoming. There can't be any change. The absolute is changeless, beginningless, partless, one supreme whole. And it always remains such. Even the creation, which appears to exist, <laughs> actually is just a projection, a picture. It doesn't really exist. The, the apparent duality is an illusion. The apparent motion and change is all an illusion. It's maya, that which does not exist. See? <laughs> so, Really, consciousness never moves. Even when we uh, leave one body at death and go into another body in the womb of our next mother, consciousness never moves. Only the point of view moves. That's why the Buddhists say there is no reincarnation. See, reincarnation is associated with the idea of a permanent existence, a soul. This is a favorite idea of the Dvaitavadas, the dualists. Huh? But the dualists are wrong. <laughs> They're at the very bottom of the stack, okay? So their views are very much conditioned by the illusion of material existence, uh, which is not true. So what's really happening behind the scenes <laughs> is that due to ignorance, one forms a desire for another body. And at the time of death, the point of view of consciousness simply shifts from one body to another. Nothing really happens. There is no soul to move from one place to another. Only the point of view moves. Ramana Maharshi used to give a nice example. He said, you've come here from far away, and you say, I traveled. But actually, you simply got on the train. <laughs> the train moved. You sat there comfortably in your seat. <laughs> or if you're on an Indian train, uncomfortably <laughs> in your seat. And the train moves from one place to another. You don't move. Your body doesn't move. You sit down. Huh? You place your luggage on the rack. You don't hold it on your head huh? or your backpack or whatever. And then the train moves and you get down and you're in a different place. 
the same thing happens in the so-called transmigration, right? That one takes one's baggage, the mind, the desires, the ego, all this stuff, and puts it on the rack, <laughs> sits down, and the point of view moves from one body to another. That's what reincarnation really is. And the same thing with enlightenment. There really is no such thing as unenlightenment or enlightenment. Because there's no duality. <laughs> the enlightenment is what's always true. And the unenlightenment is what's only sometimes true. So it doesn't have any real existence. It's only an illusion, appearance. Huh? a play <laughs> so what happens is it's not that there's a path where one makes step-by-step -step progression from unenlightenment to enlightenment huh? people like to believe that maybe it helps to motivate them to practice or something in in some stages huh? but really it, <laughs> all that's happening is a shift in the point of view try to understand it's just like traveling on the train. And then Shiva says, the effulgence of pure wisdom, which is completely devoid of visible phenomena. Now, and he, he, there's, there's no consciousness in the Supreme, and there's no phenomena in the Supreme. Does that mean that the, the enlightened person just lives in a blank state or something? No, no, no. He sees what we call the world, but he doesn't see it as phenomena. He sees it as an appearance only. See, this is why, this is why the enlightened being doesn't take much trouble to try to make an ideal situation in this world. Because there is no ideal situation. We talked last time about anicca, dukkha, anatta, huh? that the world is always impermanent, full of disappointment and suffering, and not self. Well, that's always the case with the world. Because the world is just an illusion, a projection, a, 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 an appearance. <laughs> so how could it be permanent? Huh? Or how could it be satisfying? Or how could it be self? It's not possible. See, all this, all this fits together very nicely, doesn't it? The Buddha's teaching and the Advaita teaching are in perfect harmony. They just use a different type of logic, different vocabulary of expression, that's all. The Buddha's teaching uses negative logic. Neti, neti. This is not it. This is not it. This is not it. The, the Vedic teaching uses positive language, positive logic. This is Shivam, this is Shakti, this is Brahman. So this, this conclusion is the same. <laughs> whichever way you approach, whichever point of view <laughs> you come from, huh? whichever side of the mountain you climb, the top is the same. The path may look different. But the destination is one. So the uh, being is simply uh, looking at the world like a show. Huh? I mean, you don't become attached to a TV show or a movie. Well, some people do. <laughs> they get all involved. <laughs> if the show ends in some way they don't like, they'll, they'll write the producer, you know. <laughs> But uh, an intelligent person realizes, hey, this is just a show. This is just an act. I, don't know, I forget, there was one comedian, maybe it was Lenny Bruce. There was somebody more, more recently too, but I forget who. People were complaining, oh, you're using dirty words, you're, which now is like nothing, right? But in those days, in the 1950s, it was a big deal, 1960s. And you're talking about drugs and sex and rock and roll and who knows what else, right? 
And Lenny Bruce was saying, it's just an act. It's just a show. What are you getting so upset about? So if you like the show, stay and watch. If you don't like, leave. You know, <laughs> it's the same thing here. This phenomenon, this material existence, this creation, this world is just a show. You know, if you don't like it, get out. <laughs> and you can get out. That's the thing. You can very easily get out. In fact, you're already out. You just have to stop believing that it's real. That's all. Because that's only a story that was told to you so many times that you wear it like a mask and you see through it like a filter, like colored glasses or something. Huh? This theory that the world is real, consciousness is an arising uh, due to material phenomena, uh, the self is the body, and so on and so forth. And, you know, you know. <laughs> It's what everybody thinks, right? But the enlightened person doesn't believe that story. He looks with his own vision and he sees, oh, look at this whole world disappears every night when I go to sleep. And it reappears every morning when I wake up and I have some desire. So this world is not real. It's just phenomena. See, this is why... <laughs> had this insight last night. This is why material science rejects and denies the subjective. And they insist on so-called objective evidence. Because objective evidence is from out there in the world. So it's going to have the attributes of maya, huh? of phenomenal existence. And it tends to prove their theory that the objective world is real. But if we allow subjective evidence, then we have to explain consciousness, <laughs> which they can't do. Then we have to explain why the world disappears when you go to sleep. Then we have to explain dreams, see? And we have to explain deep sleep also. We have to explain the light that you see in meditation. And they can't do that. And because they can't do it, they come up with this tricky argument to deny it, to deny that evidence, not to admit that evidence into scientific inquiry. See, that's how they do. It's just like when you belong to a, a cult, a church, a religion, they deny the validity of anything that disagrees with their philosophy. And they say, don't watch this show, you know, don't listen to this guy, don't listen to that guy, you know, avoid sex. <laughs> because if you experience something that's contrary to their teaching, then you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a cult, this is bullshit. <laughs> so everybody is indoctrinated into the cult of materialism. And in so doing, they deny their own subjective consciousness and experience. And because of that, they don't see what's right in front of their nose. <laughs> they remain conditioned in the material existence and consciousness. They don't transcend consciousness and go to the pre-conscious state of pure being, which is completely subjective. Huh? How is that? Because if the creation is simply an appearance, in Brahman, then Brahman can be aware of it without being dual, without being objective, see, without being split into subject and object. Brahman or Shiva remains one, and Maya appears and disappears, and appears, and disappears. <laughs> so once you understand this, there's no more need for any path, meditation, uh, tapasya, 
sadhana, rituals, prayers, mantras, da 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 da, da all this stuff. And this is what Shiva is going to say in the next verse. <laughs> there's no need for all this <laughs> because there is no path. You simply have to realize what you really are and have always been. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.